Okay, in part one we talked about uh, the beginning of the war as far as the Navy is concerned. We also talked about the threat that the U-boats posed to the convoys. In part two, I'd like to describe the countermeasures. What did the Allies do to try to defeat the U-boat threat? Well, first, you need to be able to detect the U-boats. And uh, the Allies used uh, both their brains and their technology to come up with a number of different ways to do that. This photograph shows a Sunderland uh, which is a large uh, amphibious plane loaded with anti-submarine uh, detection equipment. It also, of course, would have the means of attacking a submarine. This photograph shows the inside uh, of the two uh, decks in this airplane. Um, you can see here that it's uh, been nicknamed the Flying Porcupine, uh, but uh, notice the, the uh, crew in the top uh, this fellow up here has got a window, so he's doing visual sighting. And then we've also got crew. Uh, you can see here, uh, both of them also have machine guns. And uh, deeper in the hull, you would have men working with electronics. Now, the Allies had a tough decision to make. They had uh, limited resources. And so they have to decide, do we uh, take uh, bombers? This is an example of an American-built B-17. Do we take bombers and employ them to drop bombs, or do we take the bombers and employ them to detect the U-boats? Obviously, the U-boats are going to surface at nighttime, where they're going to be in relative safety. And so the American, pardon me, the, uh, the British developed a device called the Lee Light, a uh, very high-intensity light that they could uh, attach to the wings of the uh, patrol aircraft. Uh, to try to detect the U-boats on the surface. Now, if you've watched uh, war movies, you know about uh, sonar and how uh, uh, sonar works. Uh, basically, it's an electronic device that sends a sound wave through the water. Uh, if the sound wave comes in contact with metal, it will bounce off the metal and return to the ship. And in that way, uh, the sailors on the surface can try to locate uh, submarines under the surface. Uh, the Canadians and the British used a system called ASDIC, and that stands for Anti-Submarine Detection Investigation Committee. Uh, this was very important in terms of uh, changing uh, the, the game so that the Allies would have uh, the advantage. However, it's important to recognize that it takes a, a long time to train somebody how to use this system effectively. And so, although ASDIC was, was introduced near the beginning of the war, uh, it took years before the, uh, the Canadian Navy was really effective in its use. Another system that was used is called, uh, well, it's nicknamed Huff Duff. It stands for High Frequency Direction Finding. And basically, uh, the ships would have uh, an antenna array uh, on, their, uh, on their superstructure. It would be connected to a receiver, and the technician would then uh, use the receiver to um, to detect U-boat radio transmissions. Of course, the U-boats had to be communicating with their home bases and uh, and with one another, and so uh, the Allies would try to detect those systems. Uh, you can see that uh, from the cartoon that not only would the uh, receivers be on ships, but they would also be located on land. Uh, if two different receivers uh, receive a signal from a U-boat, then uh, they just have to find the bearing, uh, the compass bearing that the signal is sent on, and then when where the two bearings cross, that's where the ship is. This isn't 100% accurate, and of course, as, as the war moved on, the Allies became more effective at using the system. In addition to, to ASDIC and Huff Duff, the Allies also used radar. Um, and so here you can see a Wellington bomber, uh, nicknamed a Wimpy, but you can see that the bomber has uh, um, radio masts on the top of its fuselage and um, it's using this to um, send out radar signals. Now uh, in addition to the uh, electronic detection systems um, the British were lucky very early on to break the German secret codes. Uh, the secret codes uh, were sent with a machine called an Enigma machine and this is it here and so um, Br British mathematicians were able to crack the codes very early on. Um, the British had to be careful about how they used the information that they received uh, from the Enigma codes because 
if the Germans were able to figure out that the British had cracked their codes, they of course would stop using that system and they would come up with a new one. Um, now the British had their own codes called the Admiralty Codes. Uh, they used a machine called Ultra and uh, unfortunately for the British, the Germans uh, twice in the war were able to crack the Admiralty Codes. Fortunately for the British, they were able to learn that their codes had been broken and they could change them. The Germans never did find out that the British had cracked Enigma. Now in terms of detection, uh, the Germans warn a U-boat is surfaced recharging its batteries. It would uh, uh, be listening for um, signals from the convoys and, uh, and they would use the information from those signals to track the convoys, both in terms of their direction and their speed. Now, of course, the Germans knew roughly where the Allied convoys were going to be. This allowed them to, uh, to be more precise. Once you find the U-boats, you have to be able to kill them. And one of the primary uh, weapons uh, was called the depth charge. These were basically just 50-gallon drums uh, filled with high explosive. This is the back of a Canadian Corvette, which we'll talk about in a moment. Uh, but you can see the, um, the rows of depth charges here. Uh, these are mortars. This is the back of an American Coast Guard ship, and uh, it is deploying its depth charges. Basically, they would set the depth that they wanted the, uh, the munitions to explode. They would set them at different heights, or pardon me, different depths, and uh, hope to attack uh, successfully the U-boat. Okay, this is a Hedgehog anti-submarine mortar, again, used to attack U-boats on the surface. When we think about torpedoes, we think about torpedoes as being uh, only on submarines, but uh, even today, surface ships uh, mount torpedoes on their decks. This is an example of a mine, um, and so the, uh, the Allies would have to have a means of uh, detecting the mines and then uh, clearing the mines. They use ships called mine sweepers. Now, I've mentioned before the importance of aircraft in the naval war. Um, and uh, from this slide, you can see that the Allies uh, established escort carriers. So these would not be full-on aircraft carriers uh, like the type you're used to seeing in the movies. They would only carry a few planes, but it allowed the uh, Allies the ability to uh, launch planes mid-ocean. It wasn't until the very end of the war that uh, the Allies had aircraft that had the range that they could fly from Europe to the middle of the Atlantic and fly from Iceland and North America from the other side. This is an example of one of the American anti-submarine planes. It was used in other theaters, of course, but the B-24 Liberator had a, a very long range and so we could get right to the middle of the Atlantic. Now, as well as having uh, uh, weapons, uh, the Allies needed to have tactics. And uh, one of their main tactics in the Battle of the North Atlantic was the convoy. Now they had used convoys in the First World War, but they needed to improve their strategy in the Second World War because of the effectiveness of the U-boat tactics. Uh, in 1942, they created the Western Approaches Tactical Unit. And this was a unit uh, in, based in England, and its sole purpose was to investigate the way the Allies were fighting the battle and to try to come up with new tactics and strategies. If you go to the BBC um, history site, um, you can find a really good interactive game that will allow you to uh, try using some of the different tactics that the Allies had in the U-Boat War. On each coast, uh, the Atlantic and in England, uh, the Allies had a, a theater room where they would uh, plot uh, the locations of the convoys and the locations of the U-Boats. This is a manifest from a convoy, um, and uh, you can see um, some of the different types of uh, cargo that a convoy might carry. Uh, this ship has a general cargo. This ship has steel, general, or food, food, uh, general cargo, steel, ore, general cargo, general cargo. Uh, 
uh, aviation fuel, aviation fuel, general cargo, aviation fuel, kerosene, gasoline. Uh, I can't read that one. Uh, steel and tobacco, lumber and grain, fuel oil, gasoline, molasses, fuel oil, lubrication oil, aviation fuel. So you can see that uh, this convoy has a lot of fuel. And of course, uh, Great Britain needs fuel.